Okay, um, so uh, hold my beer and watch this. Um, this was a challenge put to me by an, an old friend who said you should, you should submit titles, uh, or submit talks entitled this, and I said, well, what should the talk be about? And he said, I don't care, just always submit the talks like that. So I had one at London Pro Workshop, but I wasn't able to attend, so Fosdem gets to hear this, and then maybe some other ones. Uh, so unfortunately, too, I also was, uh, I was writing slides right up until like two minutes ago, uh, so I didn't get a beer, so I don't have a beer for anybody to hold. So um, if anybody wants to pass one up, that's... <laughs> So, let's see. So, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Stephen Little, but I also respond to Steve Ahn because that's how it's spelled and all the Russians at work pronounce it that way. So whatever, just call me Stephen. Um, in 2005, I wrote Moose. Uh, in 2010, I started a project called the P5 Mop, which was an attempt to put Moose into the Procore. I've spoken about it previously at FOSDEM and at other workshops and Perl, things like that. Um, it's been a long time running and uh, there's been multiple different versions, uh, but now I'm done. Uh, so that's what this talk will actually be about. We'll talk about the different pieces that I've built for this, and then I'm putting them out to the community to test them, play with them, uh, experiment with them, see where it goes, and hopefully then in 2020 I will profit from this in some way. <laughs> but we'll see. Assuming the world is still around. Let's, let's, let's go through it. So, Anyway, so P5 Mop through the ages, uh, it had a bunch of different uh, uh, iterations. The first one was obviously called P5 Mop. Uh, it ended up being an overcomplicated mess. Uh, there was a P5 Mini Mop, which was an attempt to do a small version of it that we could bootstrap the first version with, so we could write the mop inside the mop, and then and it just got really, really messy and complicated. Didn't work. I took a year off and sort of like let my brain refry. Um, P5 Me Mop Redux was another, yet another attempt. Uh, that one ended in a, just a giant mess of excess uh, code, which, which led me to write P5, P5 Mop Excess, which pretty much just seg faulted really reliably and did nothing else well. <laughs> um, I'm not a C programmer. And so finally, uh, this was the last version of it. So again, seriously, what the fuck? Um, and that one actually proved fruitful. Um, it took a little while. I had to refine it, and it's been a, it's been I've been playing with it for about a year and a half. Uh, but it's essentially uh, I, what I what I've done in the last uh, maybe month or so is I've taken all the pieces and I've split them up. And part of the reason I split them up was I wanted to be able to uh, I, I actually wanted to be able to use some of these parts and not have all of them. So some of these parts require 522. Uh, some of these parts require 514. Some of these parts require 510. Some of these parts actually can, are backwards compatible to 5.6. Uh, so at work, we mostly use modern pearls. I work for booking.com. We're mostly on 518.2, and we're about to upgrade to 524. So I don't really worry about these things. But in my personal work, I do a lot of stuff that I want to support across many versions. So. What I'm about to present to you is six different CPAN modules that when you put them all together, you can get yourself a very nice, modern-looking Perl object system that uses all the new bells and whistles. Uh, you'll see that at the very end, but we're going to start first with something that actually is backwards compatible to 5.6. 5, 5 um, so I call this universal object. It is on CPAN right now. And what this essentially is uh, uh, aims to be is your, your, your core base class. So if you have Java, you have C Sharp, you have things like this, you get an object already that has a built-in constructor and it understands certain things. Uh, this was one of the things that Moose provided that people really liked was, a, was its basically its own constructor. So you could just say use Moose and then immediately you got a new and you could make instances of your object and it was very easy out of the box. So this, uh, this module basically does that. And what it does is it provides, it provides a certain set of conventions about how to build your objects. So the first convention is that you put all your slot information, meaning all the information about the fields that you want to have inside your class, you put that inside uh, a package variable called uppercase has. This is very similar to how you would do inheritance, which would be with the at isa. Okay? So it's building on those same types of conventions, and essentially you put in there a key for the slot name, and then a subref, which will pr provide the initial version of that slot. From there, it also gives you other things. It gives you new, build args, bless create, re repr slots, and build demolish, which I'll explain as we go here. Um, so has, as I said, was a slots. So here's an example of that. Um, so we, we want to inherit from a universal object, and then we define two slots, x, and it, the default value is a zero, y and the default value is a zero, so a very simple point class, and that's it. We have a constructor now because we inherited it from universal object and all other fun stuff comes along with that. Um, so this is really just a convention. There's no code that actually implements this. There's just code that uses this and understands this convention. 
Um, this convention also works great for inheritance, okay? Uh, because of the way Perl does list flattening and stuff like that, this point has is basically brings in all those fields and inherits them uh, in there. And we can actually tell the difference between an inherited field and a non-inherited field because this sub, if we actually dig under the covers a little bit, we know which, which package it was actually compiled in. So we know that this was, was a slot for, for pa package 3D and the other inherited ones are for point and we always can know that because we can always track that information. Um, so. New is your, uh, it's very similar to Moose Constructor. You can take a hash ref or you can take key value pairs, also very similar to how Perl 6 does things. So we have that in place. Um, build args is also something that comes out of Moose, which also we stole from Perl 6, which is a way to uh, essentially mangle the arguments on the way in. So uh, key value arguments are really simple, really straightforward, very easy to use and everything like that, but they're not always the API you want. Sometimes you want a different API. So sometimes you want to just pass in maybe two, two integers and you want it to basically to inflate into the key value pairs. So this is what you would do with build args. If you've done any build, if you've ever used the build arg feature in Moose or anything like that, you'll, you should be really familiar. Basically, I notice that I only have two uh, elements in my arrays, and I say, okay, I'm going to assume that's, that's my two, two element form, and I'm going to turn it into this and return it, or I'm just going to call the super. And all build args does is it mangles the arguments, turns them into canonical representation of a hash ref, uh, which is key value pairs. Um, the next step is bless and create, which is very tied to repr and slots, so I want to explain this. This is re really where all the extension mechanisms uh, are, are, are situated within this uh, work. So you pass your args into new, new calls bless. Bless is uh, actually going to get that, that canonical hash ref that build args just created, so bless gets that first. Bless's responsibility is, can we guess? Bless. To bless, yes. That's really literally all it does because it just calls create to construct your instance. So most of your extension points, if you wanted to do different kinds, if you want to do uh, array-based instances or scalar ref instances or, or how you inherit from non-universal uh, object classes, all that ends up being done in create. So create can construct your instance however you want. It calls repr, which the default version just gives you back an empty hash ref. So that's the representation. This is all very Perl 6-ish. Uh, where are my Perl 6 people? <laughs> okay, yeah. Is that, that still in there? It's still part of Perl 6? Repr? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So, just want to make sure. Um, so, uh, uh, return to hash ref, and then it also calls slots, which gets that has information there. So, say you wanted to do all this, but you don't like the fact that I'm storing the slot information it has, override slots, put it wherever you want, I don't care. It, because as long as that gets it, all the other construction protocol bits, they all fit together. Um, so, as I said, uh, overriding a class that itself doesn't use universal objects, so has its own different set of constructors, is as simple as this. Um, so if you think most times with the constructor, you call the super constructor and then you do things to it yourself and make sure it's blessed into your class. This will actually end up resulting being blessed into our class properly, uh, but we're calling the legacy constructor, we're passing anything into it, so uh, uh, setting up their arguments as they expect, and the result of that will then go through all of our other steps. So it'll get blessed properly into our class, all the slots uh, that we expect will go into it, things like that. Um, it's also how you get custom instances. So return, the representation is an array ref. Well, so this will essentially put all that together. So it gets the slots from the class, it gets the, the representation, and then it basically pulls the things out of the protos, which is the, the arguments, and if it doesn't have them, it just calls the slot initializer right there. And it puts the whole thing together, and we always know that x is at zero and, and y is at one, and it's very easy. Of course, this doesn't uh, inherit well, so you have to do this, but this is kind of weird. Map, sort, keys, slots, this gets really kind of cryptic and messy. Um, but this is how it would work to, to inherit stuff. You can also do scalar references. You can do whatever you want in here. If you wanted to do a custom C type instance, uh, you could do this. So all these extension points exist. Um, that was a little heavy. Did that, did that, that wasn't explained well. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, well, because you want consistent. Otherwise, keys are just going to give you random things, and you want, you want to know the position of your things in your instance. Yeah, yeah, so it's an array. Um, yeah, messy. Um, I, I didn't even bother showing how multiple inheritance would not work and all this kind of stuff. So, um, 
So anyway, that, that, they get a little fancy, but it allows you to pretty much have a lot of freedom uh, with your expression or with your, with your representation types and things like that. And then there's build and demolish, which was part of Moose. Um, basically, new calls build all, and build all will look all the way through your inheritance chain, call every build that it sees in it in the proper order, and then on the opposite side, destroy will call demolish all, which will then demolish in the exact opposite order that, that build happened, so that you can properly, uh, uh, yeah, basically get rid of or set up and get rid of uh, resources in your class if you want to. So, and all this, 5.6. Who here uses 5.6 still? <laughs> awesome. Nobody. <laughs> if you did, <laughs> now this works with this. Um, it actually it uses MRO, which is a 510 feature, uh, and MRO compat if you need something before that. But otherwise, it has zero dependencies, and it is basically ready to go into core as soon as we feel it's stable enough and, and Sawyer says, OK, or I buy him enough vegan cookies, one or the other. Um, so. Anyway, so that's universal object. Universal object I specifically pulled out because I wanted to use that in a lot of places. I wanted to just be able to write a very small CPAN module with minimal overhead and be able to have a nice, nice base class, a nice construction protocol because I ended up re-implementing this over and over and over again. So that's there, it's out on CPAN. The next phase is something that I, I've fiddled with a number of times, um, and this is, this, is, yeah, this is a bit of a weird one, but I think this is really useful. So Perl has within it a set of compiler phases, okay? Do we, we all know what these are? Anybody, anybody a little confused on these? Anybody just seen them but never knew quite what the hell they were good for? Okay, all right, good, so everybody knows. Okay, so begin happens immediately. You have a begin block, as soon as it's parsed, it's executed. It doesn't know if there's new more begin blocks in front of it, it doesn't care if there's any begin blocks before it, it just immediately runs. Check will run last in first out order, init blocks will run first in first out order, unit check is one of my favorites, unit check, so begin check and init will all work with the, the, uh, uh, the compile phase of the interpreter. Unit check, however, every time a, com a unit a, 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 a compilation unit is created. So every time you use a module or, or every time you load a bit of code or eval a bit of code, unit check gets fired at the end of that compilation stage. Um, so that becomes very, very useful in terms of uh, uh, finalizing things or cleaning up resources at the end of the compilation phase before you hit runtime. And then of course there's the end blocks in there. So these you can just write, you know, begin and then put a block there or check and put a block there and stuff like that. That's all well and good. However, you can't easily programmatically install a new unit check block or a new begin block or, or a new thing like this. If you had that ability, you could do all sorts of things for what's called multi-phase programming. It's basically macros on crack is how I look at it. Um, if you think of macros, macros have an expansion time. So they expand and then the code gets compiled. Well, this is, these can essentially work in a similar sense in that they can expand the code. Now, there's no, it's not just text expansion like C. It's a little bit closer to maybe Lisp, but not even that because there's no real syntax. It's Perl. You can just manipulate the shit out of everything <laughs> because the interpreter leaves everything open, and so you can do all that. So what, what is this useful for? Well, not a whole hell of a lot. It's a very, it's a low-level internal thing, um, but you can do interesting stuff. So what I've done is I've created a module that allows you to programmatically either in queue, meaning just run this in the next, uh, the next iteration, or you can specifically append or prepend to the list. Because actually what Perl does internally for all these, uh, these blocks, it just has a, an AV, a, a Perl array. Uh, and it just stores them in there. So you can push onto it, you can pop on it, you can unshift, you can do whatever you want. I don't rec recommend doing whatever you want because it probably will seg fault for sure because you're gonna confuse Perl very quickly. But what this tries to do is give you sensible versions of it. So um, for the most part, the most useful part that I found of it is when you're in a begin block, you can actually uh, in queue for something to run in the next begin block, which just becomes really useful for weird mop stuff, which I'll show you later. Uh, but this right now will give you some idea of maybe where you might be, be able to use this. So in your import, if you were to do a bunch of things in your begin routine, I mean, nobody does that, right? Uh, we, we don't have million dollar euro companies built on, on that. We do that badly at booking. It's pro yeah, Liz, <laughs> she's yeah, guilty. Um, so, so at booking, we do a lot of preload stuff, and we, we, we try and preload as much as we can in the compile time of, of the Perl interpreter so that, yeah, all our worker lifetimes are very nice and very clean. Um, this would be a way maybe to check it. So we would check, we'd start the timer, and then actually at the end of compilation, for sure, we could, we could then check the timer. So if we were to do a lot of stuff, we could test things like that. Uh, 
it's hard to really come up with examples for this module because it's so weird. But it's one of those things that when you, when you find yourself, uh, when, when the solution presents itself and it's this, there's no other way to do it. So it's really, but it's really about uh, controlling the different uh, compilation steps. And the reason why is because a lot of the things that I'm doing in here, as we'll see as we go along, it's really important that they're all finished by uh, by, the, by the beginning of runtime, and this ends up with two two main benefits. One for the pre fork, so you're not doing you're not pre forking and then doing a bunch of work. You're 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 able to do all the work in the pre fork and then handle the, the copy on write and things like that. Um, and then also um, uh, modules like B double colon C, which compiles your Perl application to C, which cPanel uses, should theoretically be able to also benefit from this because the way they work is they get to the check phase and they freeze. And then that's where, the, that's where your C program starts out from. So all that work should be done beforehand, and you can have it there. So anyway, this is, again, silly little stuff. Um, okay, next module is also a bit of, why didn't that go forward? There we go, okay. Next module is also a little, uh, a little funky. Um, do we have, okay, I'm running low. Uh, begin lift, okay. Um, how many of you fucked around with Haskell at all? Haskell? Okay. So Haskell has this idea of being able to lift subroutines and being able to run them at, at earlier points and stuff like that. This is basically a ripped off, half-assed Perl version of that. Um, what begin lift does is it allows you to create uh, uh, basically things that look pretty much like a statement keyword. And they operate very much like a statement keyword. And they also do all their work within the compile phase. And then they leave literally no trace of themselves afterwards. So it becomes a no-op when it's actually run and executed in, uh, 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 in runtime. So this one, it's very easy to show a simple example. But it, there's a lot of stuff under the covers. I'm not going to get into it because I'm running low on time. I want to get to the next stuff. But it's this simple. So if you wanted to write a Moose-style clone and call it Caribou, you could do begin lift. Begin lift, and we install into the caller, so the calling uh, person, we install extends. And then whatever, whenever extends runs, it does this. So this is obviously pushing onto the ISA. So it's just basically mimicking some sort of inheritance relationship. And then you can do this in your code. And it is functionally equivalent to, in a begin block, doing the ISA there. So again, all of the work is done in uh, the earliest time possible. And there is nothing left for the interpreter to do at runtime. So this was also one of the things with Moose, is that Moose did a lot of stuff in runtime. And so it had a lot of overhead in that sense. This cuts out a lot of these, these, this overhead because it does it as early as possible into the uh, interpreter. So um, that one was weird. So, uh, but th those two parts are, are very important bits you'll see later. <laughs> Sorry, the buildup. Um, like I said, I just wrote this talk beforehand. So I, I'm, I'm improvising. So the actual mop. So the MOP is a meta object protocol. MOP is essentially an interface to things like classes and methods and slots, and also in this case, roles. So roles are a concept that, uh, well, they go back to small talk in the traits paper a long time ago. Perl 6 picked them up. Uh, we introduced them to Perl 5 with, with Moose and some other things. Uh, and they've actually they, they've, they've gotten pretty good traction. Um, most other languages are starting to have something like this, traits in Scala. Uh, what was the other one? There was a, Rust has traits, um, stuff like that. So uh, mop role is basically an API to all that kind of stuff. Um, it is based on universal object in the sense that it f follows the has convention for the slots. Okay. It is also stateless. This was one of the big problems with Moose was that Moose kept all this state in the meta object and all this state in basically was in the Perl interpreter and it had to keep them in sync at all times and that, that cost a lot. This doesn't care at all. All state is stored in the package in some way. So methods are stored in the stash, uh, slots are stored in has, uh, inheritance relationships are stored in isa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't store any state, so this makes them very easy. They're minimal overhead. They have very little extra memory added because they essentially just bless a reference to whatever it is they're introspecting. So bless a reference to the, the code, uh, bless a reference to the, to the actual stash of, of the class. Um, and so this allows them to be, to be built, lazy, built lazily um, and, and, and then have minimal overhead. So again, uh, fixing some of the stuff in, in, in ah, fixing some of the stuff in Moose. Um, this is essentially how they work, how they fit together. A role is going to have a bunch of methods, one for each uh, method in the, in the class, and have slots, one for each corresponding slot. 
Uh, mop role covers all this functionality because a role pretty much is something that has methods and basically the only difference between a role and a class is that a role can't be instantiated and a class can. So a mop or a class can pretty much have all the same capabilities of a role. So mop or a class does a role, role, role. Class, class does role, role, if that makes sense. Right? Okay, that was clear, right? Um, anyway, so it, it's, it's metacircular in that way, but it's, but it's low overhead. Um, uh, da, da, da. So, uh, sorry, this was what I was talking about before. Inheritance information is in the ISA. The methods are stored in the actual package stash. The role relationships in does, and the slot information is in has. Produces a very small overhead. So you end up, um, what was I going for with this one? Okay. Oh, oh, sorry, 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 yeah. So you, if you remember this before, we had, uh, sorry, like I said, just was writing the slides as I was standing out there. Um, we have the has, so we have the x and the y for the point, and then we want to inherit uh, here in point 3D. Well, this is a pain to have to do this. And, and one of the things about Perl OO that has always been painful is that you repeat the same strings all the time. So there's always a possibility of a problem there. So well, here comes the mop. So. Uh, mop role new, okay? Now, if you all remember before, that looked like a class, right? So why am I doing a role here? Well, because a role is a subset of a class, and I don't care about the function. For what I'm going to do, I don't care really about the, the functionality. Actually, wait, no, should I do? Never mind, ignore me. Forget about that. Um, anyway, I create a bunch of roles in there. Go in the MRO. That's the, uh, the uh, 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 postfix dereference syntax. Very nice, you should all try and use it. So what this does though is this goes through all the different classes that I inherit it from. Okay, so that's going through all the MROs there, that first loop. In the second loop, I get all the slots in all those classes, and then I go through, and if, if I have the slot of that name, or if I have an alias slot of that name, I skip this. But otherwise, I put it in there. And what this essentially does is it grabs all the inherited slots, pulls them up, and merges them cleanly into one spot. So this is the type of thing that the, the mop can do. It can manipulate and, and combine all these things together uh, uh, for, the, for inheritance. Uh, you could, it, you, you, the role composition works in the same way. So it's the API into the methods, the slots, the, the roles, and the classes, and you can build stuff with that. So, um, and I'm running way low on time. So um, the, real quick here. Method traits. Um, how many of you know uh, Perl 6 traits? Or Python decorators, Java annotations, okay? So it's like that, but it's better described as an actual use case for code attributes. Do we all know what code attributes are? They're those things after a colon on, on a subroutine that nobody ever uses and everybody's like, what the hell? Yeah, you probably use it, yeah. A few of us have used them in anger here and there. Um, I've never found a good way, to, good, a good use for them because they're such an annoyingly tricky and difficult API to get your head around, so every time you get five minutes into it, you go, forget it, it's not worth it. Um, so I finally persevered. So uh, because I really do like annotations in Java, I want a similar feature in Perl, and, it's, it, and I want it to behave in very much the way that Perl 6 traits do. Um, so that's what we have. Uh, so you have to load a trait provider, which is essentially a package with, uh, with subroutines named for your traits. Okay, you're basically just associating a handler with, with other stuff. So what this will do in the background is it'll actually use that B compiler phase hooks to install a begin block that will install all the things that you need to collect, to all, all the, the weirdness of the Perl API to collect uh, this information and, and to apply, or I'm sorry, and to apply the, the, the uh, uh, provider. Um, and then it'll remove itself. It'll then encode another, inject another begin block to remove all evidence of that. So you don't see that you just used a feature in Perl. Uh, it takes it all away. It cleans it all out because essentially, otherwise you mess up your namespace. So that's how to implement that. That's all you do. That's your provider uh, thing. The, uh, uh, the handler gets the meta object. So this is a mop class object. The method name that you had that you uh, uh, attached this to, um, and then any, any other additional information. So if you remember beforehand, we have the type read only, read write, and then the slot uh, value in there. So basically, just write this, and it uses the mop again to add a method of the name, and it creates a, a read only accessor or a read write accessor, and using the slot name there. Um, this. Uh, is also introspectable. So if you if you get a mop method object, 
Uh, you'll find that the code attributes are there, so we do leave them, leave those in there for because Perl expects them. Uh, then uh, you can also grab the actual trait object, which will have it broken down into the actual uh, name of the trait, the arguments for the trait, and then you can actually find out the fully qualified name of the handler that's going to be calling it as well. Um, you can get crazy with this if you want. Uh, get opt here. So we're getting this string. We're going to obviously turn this into an op spec, right? And then we got these. This is also, by the way, not only is this maybe a good use case for these, this feature, it's also maybe a use, good use case for the, uh, uh, the pre-declared subroutines. Because I'm going to build the entire guts of this. I might as well just not bother setting it up here. Um, get opt is implemented like this. <laughs> OK? Now you're all going, what? That's because get opt, and again, if you've worked with Java annotations, Java annotations just smack some stuff onto your class, and then you can tell Java annotations whether you want, you want them to keep it at runtime or, or do it at, at uh, or just keep it for compile time, but another class has to inspect that and do something with it. So it separates the concerns a little bit there. So in this case, just for this case, I implemented get opt in this way. So uh, I can loop through all the methods in my meta, so assume that's my class. Uh, I can get the, if I have a code attribute that is opt, so I know that I'm looking for that, I can get rid of them if I don't have it, uh, get the trait, make sure that the trait is also opt, and then from there I can build the op spec. So I had all those strings, I can start to slice them up and build the op spec, and then I can pass it into get opt long, and then I can get my values out, and I can be done. I actually have a test of this that works with all the code that's missing, and I'll comment it out here. Um, but uh, there's this. Uh, this is also, if you're familiar with Jackson, which is a Java library for for um, uh, uh, JSON serialization and data binding, this same thing can be implemented uh, through the same way. Also have a test that shows that working. Uh, if you've used the JAX-RS uh, web service uh, annotation sets, those are also very nice. Hibernate, Hibernate has some annotation sets for uh, validation. Basically, porting all these things to Perl would give us a lot, of, a lot of stuff. And as I said before, all this happens at begin time. So, it all happens early, early, early in your process outside of your pre-fork. So, okay, 10 minutes, so this is fast. <laughs> um, Moxie is uh, the moose redo, but not really. So uh, I don't have a better name for it. Um, if anybody has a good name for it, we can come up with one. Uh, but essentially, it uses all those things that I just showed you before. So extends and has are both implemented with the begin lift. So again, these things all happen uh, very early in the compile time um, and turn into the, the canonical versions of themselves. Uh, we're using method traits. So we have uh, all, your, all your standard uh, moose things. You have your read-only accessors, your read-write accessors. We have pre Predicates that we can you can uh, 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 set up um, clearers like a lot of those those features in Moose to generate different types of accessors. It did it here, or we, we have versions of it here, um, and you can see also with the extends. Now, one of the things I know some of you might be looking at this and saying, okay, we've got some redundancy here, right? We we got X up there and and Y. Why aren't we associating our our accessors with that? Well, again. Uh, compile time, it'll know it's here. It's, there's less for me to generate. I just have to stick in a new version or a new sub, uh, but the glob is already there. So we're, we're, doing, we're doing less work, number one. And two, sometimes you want encapsulation. So one of the biggest criticisms I've always gotten with Moose is that encouraged struct style classes, meaning you create a bunch of, of fields for your class and then you have accessors for all of them and everybody can get to everything and everything's public. So with Moxie, that's not the case. You can, you can set uh, you, your, your accessors and, and, your, and your slots are separated differently. And then, oh crap, and I don't have it in here. And there's also private accessors. And when I say private accessors, and I totally forgot to put a slide in here for this. When I say private accessors, I mean we generate lexical subroutines that are not available in the dispatch of the actual class and they are also not available in to to anybody outside of the class because they're truly lexical subroutines within the scope of the package and they know what they know what self is automatically so you can basically do all stuff i totally forgot to get a slide for that it's in the test suite anyway point is we're generating a lot of these accessors for you in a slightly different way um, than normal moose, but it allows you a better set of, of, of uh, encapsulation. So you can have a better separation between what is your state, which is the, the slots that you have, 
and then what is your access and how do you how do people access that state um, it also works with overloading and stuff like that so uh, we got the accessors there um, this is just because signatures because uh, apparently overloading sends a whole bunch of extra arguments into your thing I don't know why um, oh also oh, moxie moxie also turns on signatures um, and uh, Moxie turns on postfix deref, it turns on current sub, it turns on lexical sub, it turns on postfix deref qq, it turns on ref aliasing, it turns on every cool new feature that you could ever want, including strict and warnings, in, uh, in, in, in its import. So it's sort of like Moose in that sense, and then it forces you forcefully into the future, if it can. Um, um, so this is a test that sort of runs, but, but uh, doesn't actually entirely work yet uh, in there. And I'm just, these are my last little bits here. Um, but I just wanted to show how you could extend things with the traits, uh, the method traits mechanism. Uh, Moxie supports it already. So uh, we can guess what this does. It's a read-only uh, accessor for the description. JSON parameter just tells it, hey, when you're collapsing this object from JSON, make sure you, turn, you store a field for description and a store for a field for is done. And when you pull it back out, you can do the same thing and, and, and get it out of there. Um, so these are just annotations. Again, they run outside. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, you're looking at me like, what? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going really fast here. Um, anyway, wouldn't this stuff kind of stuff be cool? I mean, Catalyst did, did uh, all sorts of messy shit with this stuff. But now we have subroutine signatures. We can add these annotations here. Here we go. Ta-da, web service. Done. <laughs> OK? And, and what's happening is there's not much going on in the class. So the class is very, very testable because What's going on with puts and consumes? It doesn't do anything to the class. So the class on its own is entirely testable by itself in this way. Now, I may have a runner that generates, understands all this meta information in all these places, and then creates something that runs this and properly delegates to these other bits that are just doing the data bits. Um, again, if you look at JAX-RS and some of the Java annotation stuff, it, it works out very nicely because you add all this meta information and you don't really need to care about it when you want to test in isolation. But then when you want to run it in, in a particular environment, you, you, the meta information adds to it. Anyway, sorry, getting all crazy. Um, what? So, um, yeah, we're building on this. It's getting there. The status. Um, universal object is stable. I've been fiddling with this thing for, geez, I don't know, like eight, nine months now. Um, I've been writing a bunch of new classes in it, stuff like that. That's entirely stable. I totally recommend people trying to use that, uh, playing with it. I love bug fixes, feature suggestions, other stuff like that. Um, doc fixes, please. Um, uh, other one, the other two, those are, those are, they involve excess that I wrote. So I'm not going to put them above alpha until I get somebody else to look over my C code. Um, but, uh, but those ones, they work. It's not that they don't work, just that I wrote the C. So that's a bad thing. Um, the mop, I'm calling it beta, but this has been around for at least a year and a half now. And I've been using it in various places for at least a year and a half now. I'm calling it beta because also there's a bunch of stuff that should be moved into XS that is currently using the Perl pure Perl, horrible, crazy, weird approach to it. Um, you move it into Excess, it'll be a lot faster. But again, I shouldn't write that Excess. Um, and that's complicated Excess. Uh, but that's fairly stable from an API perspective. Uh, method traits and Moxie, I was hoping to get released like before the talk, but I didn't because uh, I was working on the slides. So, but these things are moving forward. Um, I, I, I spent five years fiddling with this project and this idea of let's get some more modern uh, stuff into Perl, but get it into the core. Uh, and finally, now we're moving, we're moving forward in this. So, uh, yeah, questions, thoughts? I don't know if I have time enough for questions, actually. Three minutes. Three minutes, three, minutes, three questions. One, in, one minute each. When is this expected to get into the uh, So the plan and the rule was always put it on in CPAN, uh, uh, give it a little bit of time to shake out all the bugs and, and stuff like that. Then we'll move it into core. Uh, it's a negotiation, I basically, with Sawyer and everybody in P5P uh, running through stuff like that. Um, at the moment, they're all very minimal on their dependencies, so it should be pretty easy uh, to, to install from CPAN. Uh, worst case is you have to get a new test more or something like that, and that pulls down the whole world or something. Um, but, uh, but yeah, soonish? Um, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Question? Any? Are you beginning um, so I couldn't figure out his 
thing. Um, the, the, the only thing that I was able to sort of figure out at one point was um, uh, there's a Devel begin lift, which Raffle wrote, but that's full of crazy stuff as well. Okay. No, this is Zephyr one. So a couple of people have tried this in various different ways. Um, I didn't care about some of the things that they cared about, and they didn't care about some of the things I care about. Okay. Eventually, I'd like to see them all merge because I think they all try and do the same thing. But uh, there's just okay. level of crazy. Yeah. So, any other questions? No? Was there? No. We're good. Okay. We're done. Thank you.